The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. So we are on the third section of the book of Ezekiel today, Recovery by Life. The first section is about the glory. The second section is about judgment. And we know that always before revival that there is repentance, that that is the purpose of judgment. The third section is is recovery, and the fourth section is a house built by God. So we're going somewhere with this. Now, there are five main points that we're going to cover this morning. The first is life in God's house. The second point is judgment and recovery. The third point is the watchman and the shepherd. The fourth point is inward and outward recovery. And the fifth section is dry bones, sticks, and an army. So one is life in God's house. Two is judgment and recovery. Three is the watchman and the shepherd. Four is inward and outward recovery. And five, dry bone sticks and an army. So covering the first point, life in God's house. Now, in the previous message, we covered God's judgment on seven representative nations. Representative of all the nations, uh, just like the seven churches in the book of Revelation were representative of all churches. Um, The seven nations brought under judgment that we talked about were Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt. Now, the first three, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt, signify worldly riches and natural resources, including self-effort. Matthew 16, 26, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And Jeremiah 17, 5, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord, but blessed is the person who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. People in the church who focus on earthly wealth are like briars and thorns. Um, Jesus says in Matthew 13, 22, he who received seed among thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So God is working overtime getting a people, a unified people, prepared for him. And, of course, we know that one of the problems in the New Testament churches were people, the enemy sent people into the churches to cause trouble, bring division, bring separation, and to bring worldliness into the churches. And we're, it's no different. It's no different today that the enemy will sow tares in among the sons of the kingdom, right? So the church is like, or should be like, not just a house for God, but have you ever heard the expression, a working ranch? A ranch that actually produces something. The church should be like God's cultivated farm. The local church should produce life, and I'm talking about God's life, and growth 
in that life. And thorns and briars do not produce anything but irritation and pain. You know what? I doubt we would have somebody who was just purely a thorn and briar in this church because um, God has been do mu- doing so much purification, but we can have some thorns and briars in our own lives. And that's one thing that God is working on right now. Now, in understanding the spiritual significance of these seven nations in the church, we need to remember that they are that they represent enemies working against what God is trying to recover. God is trying to make us fruitful. He wants us to grow in fruitfulness there are degrees of fruitfulness um so we need to be aware of the devices of the enemy um the ammonites hate christianity in the church if they do come into the church they will attempt to undermine things of god and uh, dennis and i have read of deliberate programs brought into local churches one in particular that we read about was designed to destroy people's faith. So, the, you know, churches shouldn't just adopt programs, certainly should not adopt something that they don't know the background and they don't understand. Um, there was a, a book called um, Mama Bear Apologetics, I think was the the name and it was written by someone whose pastor invited someone into the church to teach a class and her faith was nearly shipwrecked the faith of those that she knew who the other people who were in the class never recovered their faith and this was in a particular local church that this happened now i wonder where that pastor's head was to invite something like that into the church. And I know my brother and sister-in-law, when uh, they were baby Christians, I prayed a few years for their salvation. They both were saved. And their church invited in, it was a, a lay seminary group. And what they were teaching in that lay seminary group was the very thing that destroyed my late husband's uh faith and belief in the Bible as anything other than hogwash. And they were teaching this, and my brother and sister-in-law were in this class, and I'm, I mean, I, I wept, I cried out to God, because you see, there's a corporate stronghold over um, teachings like that. That means that it's not just an isolated bad teaching coming through one person, but there are principalities and powers that take people's minds captive. And praise God, God intervened and and got some material in their hands on how faith-destroying that particular teaching is. And so they came out of it, and they were determined to go to a church that taught Orthodox Christianity after that. They actually wrote a letter to the the higher-ups in that church, telling them that they needed to offer a more balanced hermeneutical approach to the Bible. That means really teach the Bible, just don't teach theories about the Bible. So, um, So that was brought into the churches. Moabites corrupt the church with worldly thinking and behavior, if the world does it, we can we can participate in it. And Edom and Philistia corrupt the church with ideas, attitudes, and activities that come from people's flesh. Now, Jesus wants to build his church. And Jesus can only build with life, the divine nature that's been produced in us. Jesus wants to build a house where God can dwell in the midst of living stones. He can't build with our flesh. He can only build with the life of God produced in us. God doesn't want us to be saved sinners, but transformed 
sons and daughters. And our experience of Jesus during the week transforms us. And, you know, how do we know that we're yielding to the perfect humanity of Jesus during the week? Well, sometimes it's hard to tell if we're being spiritual. But one thing for sure that we can all recognize is the works of the flesh in our lives. And if you're curious about that, um, look it up in the Bible, the works of the flesh and what's produced by that. So here we do know that the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, assures us that we're in the spirit and not in the flesh so if you're wondering if you're living in the fruit of the spirit drop down and pay attention if you don't sense the flesh there then chances chances are you're at least in gentle peace if not overflowing love now when we come together as a congregation we present as a gift to God the humanity of Jesus that's been formed in us during the week. Jesus in us is the only gift that we can give to God. Now, just piling up building materials won't build a house. We are not a perpetual construction site. Jesus said, I will build my church. It takes a builder who knows what to do with the materials to build a house. I hate to tell you what I might end up with if I set about trying to build a house and know what parts went with what and what the electrical wiring and the plumbing and all that. We would end up with a mess. Um, watched a really interesting video by... Um, about a man up in Canada who built an entire well, house and other buildings and uh, uh, smoker and all this stuff using strictly hand tools. He s sawed the logs. It was actually quite interesting, and I found out later after watching the video that he is looked up to as an example of how to go off grid and build your own place. Um, but he had to know how to do it. I wonder how many YouTube videos he watched and how much practice he did before he went out in the wilderness and actually did this. Most churches in the world, by the way, are have gathered building materials, but they still haven't been built up into a dwelling place for God, which is what we are anticipating God doing here, to have a dwelling place of God Two things are required. One is life in the living stones. And we're not just like little river rocks. We are precious gems. When it talks about the New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation, the New Jerusalem is built with precious gems. Precious gems are something that has been transformed by heat and pressure. The second thing that's required is the building materials actually properly being built together. Now, by the way, we are called living stones. Stones edify, build up a house. The mortar between the stones is love. But bones are for the body. In Ephesians 4, 3, it says, Keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That word bond is the word for ligaments. Ligaments join bones together so that they can move. The bond of peace because God just doesn't want to settle down in a house. He wants a body that he can work through to do things in this world, to bring change in this world. Point two is God's judgment and recovery. The purpose of God's judgment is something that God has planned out beforehand. Whenever God brings judgment, he has a purpose. Something, is, something good is going to come out of that. God judges so he can bring recovery. God wants to gain something out of that. He doesn't judge apart from recovering or gaining something. 
Now, we learned last week that God judges based on his holiness, righteousness, and glory. Holiness, righteousness, and God's glory are the standards. Remember, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, God doesn't want to lower himself to our level. He wants to bring us up to his level. When God's people don't match his holiness, righteousness, and glory, God brings judgment or brings to repentance of people to recover, restore, and revive them. This is what we're doing when we pray for revival. When we call out for revival, we're praying that God will bring us up to his standards of holiness, righteousness, and glory. A recovered people are in alignment with God's values. A revived people have burning hearts, burning spirits for God. They love what God loves and they hate what God hates. God wants us recovered up to his standard. God wants, the ultimate purpose here is God wants a people who are close to him and we can't draw close to God unless we match his standards. So, what did God do in Ezekiel chapters 33 and 34? We see a watchman and a shepherd. God's recovery in Ezekiel. The first thing God did was set a watchman. Ezekiel 33, 7. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn the people for me. A watchman is given a commission by God to warn his people to repent and turn to him. Now, we know that in the book of Ezekiel, they were not very good listeners. However, but we also know that God found himself a remnant. That's what God is looking for today. He's looking for a remnant of people who will be wholehearted toward him. Now, in the New Testament, was there a watchman? Yes, there was. It was John the Baptist. And we know that people went down to the Jordan and submitted themselves to John's baptism of repentance. They listened in the days of Jesus better than they did in the days of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33, 11. Ezekiel told the people to repent of their wickedness and idolatry. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Now the watchman would be guilty if he didn't warn. And God told Ezekiel, they're not going to listen, but I want you to tell them anyway. The watchman would be guilty if he didn't warn. But then after the warning, the people would be guilty if they didn't turn to God and repent. Ezekiel 33, 8 through 19, when the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness, and does what is right, he shall live because of this. And then God told them in Ezekiel 33, 33, when this judgment comes to pass, and surely it will come, then they will know a prophet has been among them. They'll say, oops, should have listened. But then after the watchman, God judges the unfaithful shepherds and God himself comes to be their shepherd. Ezekiel 34, it says, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? But then... Ezekiel 34, 11 through 16. 
God says what he is going to do. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As the shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. I will feed them in good pastures. Their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away and bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. The Lord our shepherd seeks and searches. Ezekiel 34, 11, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. All of us are here today because the Lord searched and sought us and brought us to where we are today. And by the way, there are eight key points in this. One, the Lord our shepherd seeks and searches. Two, he finds us and delivers us. Three, he brings us to his good land. Four, he feeds us in good pastures. Five, he leads us to high mountains. Six, he causes us to lie down. Seven, he seeks the lost, the backslidden, and the wounded ones who were driven away. He binds up eight, he binds up the broken and strengthens the six. And eight is the number of of new beginnings. He is doing this process in us today. And by the way, what is the good land he brings us to? What is our promised land? It's Jesus and our enjoyment of him. He is our promised land. And moreover, the Lord Jesus, our shepherd, is also our king, which means that when we obey him as our king, he cares for us as the shepherd in our obedience to his kingship he establishes the throne of his kingdom within us and among us and when we're calling for the king we call for the king of glory and we throw open our hearts and welcome him and he comes as our king but he also comes as our loving shepherd and ezekiel 34 25 through 29 says he will make a covenant of peace with us i will make a covenant of peace with them and cause the wild beasts to cease from the land they will dwell safely and the wilderness and sleep in the woods i will make them and all the places around my hill a blessing and i will cause showers to come down in their season there should be showers of blessing in these verses god promises to make a covenant of peace peace with his people to give us showers of blessing to make our land fruitful to make us safe in our land god promises to deliver us and protect us and then ezekiel 34 30 through 31 he says i will be their god and they shall be my people. This is what God has been looking for all along. How many times do we read in the prophets of the Old Testament that God wants to be our God, and he wants to make us his people? Thus they shall know that I, the Lord God, am with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord God. You are my flock the flock of my pasture. You are men and I am your God, says the Lord God. The recovery of church life, what God wants the local church to be, a house built up, a body connected. Life in the church is the mingling of God with man. It's not in teaching or gifts, but in the presence of the Lord this is God's dream. We hear a lot about your dream, find your dream, discover your dream, make your dream a reality. Well, God has a dream that he will dwell with us and that we will become his house, his people, his body. And inward, point four, inward and outward recovery as God recovers us 
by forming his life in us. We also must remember that we need to bring our old man to the cross, that this is an ongoing process. Chapter 35 highlights the need for the work of the cross in the process of recovery. It talks about Mount Zaire, which stands for Edom, which represents our old man. Who knows that we're not all finished at one time, that there is a process of recovery and that we need to embrace the work of the cross and pay attention to to our old man resurrecting. Yes, we know we have been taken to the cross, that when Jesus died, we died. But I heard someone say once, the problem with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. So we need to embrace that work. Again and again, we need both inward and outward recovery. Inwardly, we need to repent, turn to the Lord, let him cleanse us. Outwardly, our nature and the way we live needs to change. Dennis has done a teaching on the deadly seas. We need to watch for those seas. And I actually have a list somewhere in here of the deadly seas. Here we go. The deadly seas are complaining, criticizing, comparing, coveting, competing, concealing, and controlling. And what the Lord has been uh, impressing me with is how often I complain about the weather. Well, guess who's in charge of the weather? Not me. When we complain, we're doing one or two things. First of all, all complaints are against God. This was a serious problem with the Israelites in the wilderness. And, of course, they complained, and they said it was Aaron and Moses they were complaining about. But then we're told that it's not really Aaron and Moses that you're complaining about. Your complaints are against me. And they had some serious judgment issues that they underwent in the wilderness because of their murmuring and complaining. The other thing is that that just grieves me is when people complain about other people to somebody who's not part of the solution or part of the problem. What are we supposed to do if we have an issue towards someone? We're to go to that person. If you bring another person into it, that's triangulation, and you're actually slandering that person with your words and planting seeds of suspicion into other people's minds. Those are seeds of poison. And that was actually, uh, John Wesley called it evil speaking, and he said it was like cancer in the church, and it was the only thing that John Wesley ever kept kicked people out of the church for doing he did not tolerate evil speaking so let's watch the seven deadly seas as god as is inwardly and outwardly bringing recovery to us another point in ezekiel 36 is recovering the good land ezekiel 36 8 through 13 says, But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to me, Israel, for they are about to come. For indeed I am for you and will turn to you. You shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it. The city shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times and do better for you than at your beginnings. Then shall you know that I am the Lord. Thus says the Lord God on the day that I cleanse you from your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities. And then God says in Ezekiel thirty-four, thirty-six, that the desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by so that they will say this land was desolate and become like the garden of eden 
God wants to make the places of our habitation like the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine? I mean, the, it, the glory of God filled that garden. There was no separation between God and man, that it was really a garden temple where God dwelt with man and they dwelt with God and God walked with them and spoke to them in the cool of the day. God wants to make here on earth, here in this place, like the Garden of Eden. However, in Ezekiel 36, 25, says that there's a further work that God needs to do. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. That's your agendas, the things you lust after. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, a soft heart. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Why? Because it's God's spirit, Jesus in us, that will walk the way God has purposed for us to walk. Galatians 2.20, that the, it's the replaced life. Said, it's not I, but Messiah in me, Jesus living through us, his perfect life, his life of perfect love. So he wants to further cleanse us from our filthiness. He wants to remove our idols. Then he will give us a new heart and new spirit. And he gives us grace, his grace, his empowerment to walk in his ways. And he puts his spirit, his spirit within us. I think God has a little bit of work yet to do in the local churches before we come to that place. But point five. The dry bones, the two sticks, and the army. Now, in the first, second, third, and fourth section of Ezekiel's, we see Ezekiel starts with the glory, brings judgment, brings recovery, and what we'll talk about next week, God's building a house for God, and that brings us full circle back to the glory. Oh, we have seen waters in the spirit. We've seen waters flowing from this place. And when God has a revived and recovered church, guess what? It doesn't stay in the four walls. It flows out into our community. It flows out into the area. We see the water of God, but also the glory of God, which is also represented by the fire. When Dennis first drove down, he'd never been to this area before. He drove across the North Carolina line, and he saw a map. Like, remember the old rawhide show, how the map burst into flame? Pa Bonanza. Bonanza, sorry. I don't know my, don't know my boomer television history very well. And it was a map of the Ponderosa, right, as somebody said. But he saw the map of the Charlotte area burst into flame. Oh, people, waters are going to flow forth from this place, and the fire of God is going to go forth. The glory of God is going to start here and go out and change our cities and communities. And by the way, we don't just complain about the world and how wicked the world is, because in truth... The state of the church determines the state of the world. So guess who is responsible? John Wesley in the 1700s transformed England, the entire nation, in every one of its spheres of influence. I mean, government, economics, the schools, everything in one generation. You know how long a generation is? 25 years transformed a whole nation but guess what there was a revived church in the nation of england and god did it then he can do it again it is not hard for god to 
do what he wants to do when he has a recovered, revived remnant to work with. This is why we, Romans 12, 1, presents your bodies a living sacrifice so God can have his way through us to reach the world. Because guess what? It's not just about the individual. It's about us making an impact out there. So God revives us for a purpose. The final section that we'll be talking about next week or in a few weeks, next time I speak, chapters 40 through 48 speaks about God fitting together his revived, recovered people into the house of God, his dwelling place. It's how does he do this? And if we know how he does it, perhaps we can cooperate better with the process. Ephesians 2.20 through 22, these are the verses that God gave us for this local church. Ephesians 2, 20 through 22, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together, remember it's a living temple, grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit, so he can build a house that's suitable for him to dwell in. And again, Jesus only builds his house with the life he's produced in us. So that involves us cooperating in our everyday life, so we can grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, so we can grow and increase in life. Now, not everyone will cooperate God needs us to volunteer to be part of that remnant, one he can work with. So in chapter 34, we see the Lord coming as shepherd. In chapter 36, we see the Lord giving a new heart and new spirit. In chapter 37, we see the Lord reviving his dead, scattered people, joining them together and making them one. In chapter 37, Ezekiel saw a valley of dry bones they were so dead and so dry that when the Lord said is there any hope Ezekiel said oh Lord you know only you could do something with this mess Ezekiel declares that the people were so dead they were just a heap of dry bones and you know what bones are in people our bones are actually living stones they're made up of minerals with marrow filling them and it was once believed um, that the blood didn't actually get into the bone itself well now they know that there are tiny capillaries in our actual bones so we are just a, a bundle of living bones so Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14 says, The hand of the Lord came upon me, Ezekiel, and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley. Indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, Oh, Lord God, only you know. And again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Oh, dry bones, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know. (coughs) Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and flesh came upon them and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. So he said to me, 
prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 and 11 through 16 speaks of how the Lord does this. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness and long suffering, putting up bearing with putting up with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And Jesus himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of of the saints for the work of the ministry what ministry is that the work of the ministry for the edifying or building together of the body of Christ till we come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of of the fullness of Messiah. What is that? That's fullness of Messiah, that we would look like Jesus, that we would be an adequate expression of Jesus in the world, and that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting but speaking the truth in love or speaking reality in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, our Messiah, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying or building up of itself in love. For the building up. See, the only way this works are for the bones to cooperate with one another, to move, move smoothly. And we need to remember, yes, and we want unity, in this local church but it grieves me to see on Facebook and I mostly go to Facebook to see grandbaby pictures but how mean believers are and we really need to get to the point where whether or not they're connected to this local body or to wherever um, you might be connected who are not part of this uh, body in Fort Mill, that you see more Jesus in other believers than you see their flesh. And you know what? If you see a lot of flesh, you should be on your face crying out for them, not criticizing, not complaining about them, but they can't change 
unless Jesus does the changing anyway. Are you crying out that Jesus perfect them, that he make them what he wants them to be? We can't change ourselves. Even if we try with our self-effort to change, we'll make an awful mess of things. So where is the prayer? Where is the prayer for one another? I see very little that sounds prayerful in what believers write about one another, say about one another, and complain about. I see a fair amount of religion, but where is the faith where the rubber meets the road in us praying for one another, holding up one another before the Lord? You know, even... Even the most carnal Christian out there, God is capable of changing them and transforming them into a representative of Jesus who looks actually looks like Jesus and behaves like Jesus. I think we do more talking about than praying for one another, and God would really like that to change. Well, in this valley of dry bones that we can say represents the church world today. The bones were out of joint. joint. They weren't unified. They weren't connected. Not one bone was connected to a single other bone. They were all in a heap together, but not joined to one another. And by the way, um, Dennis has taught on this before, we learn about Abraham, the father of our faith, in Genesis 13, 3, and he, Abraham, went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, and he camped between Bethel and Ai, very much like the Valley of Dry Bones. Bethel means house of God, what Jesus came to build, not just the church is not to be just a hospital. The church is not just a place for forgiven sinners. The church should be a house of God. And again, this is God's dream. This is what God wants to do. What Jesus came to do. But AI means a heap of stones. The church world today is scattered and dis disjointed. We're divided by denominations, divisions, strife, and doctrines. Local churches don't have much spiritual unity the way God defines unity. Dennis talks about project unity that he saw when he went on missions trips um, and heard about from people who went on missions trips, say they come together to build a church building in a local um, village and and they come together for the project, but then they go back home and they don't have any connection that lasts with one another. So most churches today are heaps of living stones. They're heaps of building materials without much building going on. But we're hearing a rattling and a shaking, aren't we? Because God is not just shaking things in the world. He's shaking the church and it's, I think it's going to shake even more. So Ezekiel prophesied twice. He prophesied and there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. That's in verse 7 and verse 9. Ezekiel prophesied again as the Lord commanded him and breath came into the bones and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. When the breath came in, they lived. When the breath came in again, they became an exceeding great army. God needs an army today. He needs, he, he wants us to be a house, but we also need to be an army because there are things that God wants to accomplish on planet Earth and he requires a recovered, revived people to do what he wants to do. And by the way, on June 6, 2021, God spoke to Dennis and me in the car. We'd, been, we'd spent um, a lunchtime talking about 
all the stuff that's wrong in the world and that looks really big to our eyes. One thing that was, oh, God, what can you do with the school system? It just seemed beyond me. And as we were thinking on these things, God spoke to us, each one, at the same time. Watch what I will do. God is going to do things that are going to blow us away. They're going to exceed our wildest, wildest imaginations. We are going to see God move, God set things right, and God have a recovered, revived people in this place. And in that vision I saw, I saw God doing it in small groups of people all over the world. And as I watched, there was like Pentecostal explosions as I looked down at the earth, here and here and here, and the whole earth began to glow gold. And it was the glory of God, and the glory of God really did cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. He's going to change everything, and I can hardly wait. But then in verses 16 and 17, the Lord told Ezekiel to pick up two sticks. Now, sticks are made of wood. Wood in the Bible represents humanity. In Ezekiel's hand, the two sticks miraculously became one stick. They were two, but now they were one. The bones were for an army, and the sticks are for a house. God's building, because God is going to build with the humanity of Jesus that's been formed in us. The army was fight for fighting battles for God. The house was for God's dwelling place. The two sticks became one. God is in the process of doing that miracle in this place. He is making a people one. We can sense the unity that God's producing. Oneness by life. We are made one by God's life in us. But life still needs a ceiling, like the Holy Spirit ceiling, not a ceiling like in a room, but to be sealed, to be baptized into a living organism. God needs a house and a body. So I want to share with you something that God did that is what we have to look forward to in the next section of Ezekiel, but to look forward to in living reality in this place. And this is in the book about Reese Howells by Norman Grubb. In March of 1936, by the way, the Lord called these people who were at the Bible College of Wales, and I'm talking about ordinary workers, you know, to, to keep a, a large um, college going, you need many levels of workers, ordinary men and women, and this did include the students, but it wasn't just the students. The Lord called for a company of living martyrs to turn the course of World War II. Romans 12, 2. So today, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. God is looking for living martyrs again. He's looking for a remnant of living martyrs. So the daily diary on the college meetings. March 29th, the most wonderful day in the college so far. Big day of surrenders, and many take up the challenge of martyrdom. March 30th, fire fell on the sacrifice. The Holy Spirit descended on the evening meeting. We went on our knees, and someone started the chorus, Welcome, 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 Holy Spirit, we welcome you. The liberty and power were so great, we continued singing this one chorus for a full hour. April 1st, Another day of worshiping and praising the Lord. He has come down on the college, and it is a new place. There is singing, singing this was in Wales, remember, singing from Derwin Far to Glen Derwin. 
in Wales. As we approached the new year of 1937, there was an increasing consciousness of God's presence. An awesome sense of God's nearness began to steal over the whole college. There was a solemn expectancy. We were reminded of the 120 in the upper room before the day of Pentecost. And in the days to follow, he came. He did not come like a rushing mighty wind, but gradually the person of the Holy Spirit filled all our thoughts. His presence filled all the place, and his light seemed to penetrate all the hidden recesses of our hearts. We had to confess that we knew nothing of the Holy Spirit as an indwelling person, that our bodies were meant to be the temples of the Holy Spirit we knew. But he, when he pressed the question, who is living in your body? We could not say that he was. We would have done so once. But now we had seen him. And the Holy Spirit said, There's all the difference in the world between your surrendered life in my hands and me living my life in your body. One by one he met us. One by one, we broke in tears and contrition before him. We yielded on his own unconditional terms. To one by one, there came the glorious realization he had entered. And the wonder of our privilege just overwhelmed us. It seemed to be a foretaste of the holy city, the New Jerusalem, and there shall be no night there. Through this falling of the fire upon the sacrifice, the Spirit had sealed to himself a company of intercessors, tutors and school teachers, doctors and nurses, domestic and office workers, gardeners and mechanics. Their duties were varied, but their commission was one. Many of the students themselves remained on as part of this praying and working company. There are times in God's dealings with his servants when he sets apart for himself not just individuals, but companies, baptized, as it were, by one spirit into one body for one God-appointed purpose. And this was now one of them. And then in this book, God goes through the history of how they, their prayers and their intercession cause strategic battles to be won. And it talks about Hitler and how Hitler had a demonic voice that he listened to. And their prayer was, God bend Hitler, and one of the exciting things it tells about how one particular time Hitler failed to listen to his voice, and that marked the turning point in World War II, is the time we live in any less crucial than World War II? The battle then was for world domination. The battle now is for world domination. So let's say, like David when he faced Goliath, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? God, as you used Paul, as you used David, Lord, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Oh, Lord, is there not a cause? Come have your way with us here. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.